1986's The Transformers The Movie is quite possibly the single most important piece of Transformers media ever, introducing characters and concepts that became intrinsic parts of the franchise's lore, which still echo across every new Transformers story told today. In this video, we're going to look at the evolution of the film's script, the multiple earlier versions of the story, what was changed and what was kept on the journey to bringing the Transformers' first big screen adventure to life. It's Transformers the Movie, The Untold Story. The story of the film begins in the summer of 1984 with writer Ron Friedman. Friedman was a script editor of sorts on the original Transformers cartoon, who rewrote the show's dialogue for consistency and flavour. And according to associate producer Flint Dilly, he had a great contract that ensured he would have a writer credit on any potential movie made of the series. Thus, as production of the scripts for the cartoon's first season was wrapping up towards the end of the summer, and production on the movie was beginning, it was Friedman who wrote the first story outline for the film. Now, we don't know exactly how much of this outline was based on demands from Hasbro, and how much Friedman came up with himself, but per Friedman's own statements, it's understood that Hasbro insisted that the story feature the death of Optimus Prime, which Friedman didn't agree with, while Friedman himself argued for the inclusion of a female Autobot, R.C. The outline served as a basis for the first draft script Friedman then produced, which was completed by February 1985. A mystery for years, a copy of this first script was finally found by Transformers fan and archivist Jim Sorensen while helping Flint Dilly to organise his storehouse of paperwork in 2020. Subsequently, Jim and I did a presentation about the script at UK convention TF Nation in 2022, accompanied by a series of unofficial artists' impressions of select scenes, which is what you're going to see as I take you through this early version of the story. Friedman's first draft takes place an unknown amount of time in the near future. Almost all the characters featured in the script are either brand new ones or taken from the first season of the cartoon. The only second season characters that show up are Decepticon Jets, Thrust, Dirge and Ramjet. Notably, none of the Autobots' established human allies like Spike with Wiki appear. The story kicks off with an army of Decepticons, with the Constructicons front and centre, laying siege to an Autobot steel mill which is defended by the film's primary heroes, youthful Autobot Hot Rod, the elderly Tanker, a grizzled one-eyed Autobot who transforms into a Sherman tank, RC, who acts as medic to those injured in the fight, Wheeljack, and their commanding officer Magnus, a mighty warrior who boldly races into action to take out a Decepticon cannon emplacement blasting the mill with napalm like fire snow. As a quick side note here, the illustration you're seeing of Magnus is based on an early original concept by the movie's character designer, Floro Deary. When it was replaced with the finished Magnus design, Deary would rework this design and reuse it for Orion Pax in the cartoon episode War Dawn later in the year. Meanwhile, Optimus Prime is on the way with reinforcements and more fuel for the besieged bots at the steel mill. He and the other Autobots are riding in vehicle mode on flatbed cars towed by a freight train, crewed by their human allies, Colonel Rusty Steel, a dry-witted Indiana Jones-type Green Beret, and the gruff General Blaze. Megatron and the Decepticons appear to bar the train's way, and Starscream tears up the tracks ahead to stop it, but it transpires that using this big, obvious mode of transport was all part of a plan by Optimus to lure Megatron out, and that the train is really a gigantic Autobot named Rails, who converts from freight train to futuristic hovering bullet train and smashes Starscream out of his path. 
Then, when the Autobots arrive at the mill, Reels transforms again to his robot mode, a colossal fire-breathing snake who breaks the back of the Decepticon siege, smashing, crushing and melting the Decepticons and their siege towers. As Reels wreaks havoc, Optimus Prime and Megatron have their final face-off. When Hot Rod spots Megatron reaching for a blaster, he intervenes in an attempt to help his leader, but Megatron exploits the distraction he creates to open fire on Prime. Though gravely wounded, the Autobot leader uses the last of his strength to deliver a fatal final blow to Megatron as well. The Decepticons take Megatron and retreat, flying off back to Cybertron, while Rusty takes charge of the shocked and horrified Autobots and lays out a plan. Ratchet and one group will take the wounded Optimus back to headquarters for treatment, while another, headed up by Wheeljack, will begin construction of a fleet of spacecraft to pursue the weakened Decepticons and finish them off once and for all. Gears isn't very happy about a human giving orders to Autobots, but RC speaks up to get the Autobots to fall in line with Rusty's plan. RC volunteers herself to be part of Wheeljack's team, which introduces one of the movie's big running gags. Wheeljack's an old-fashioned misogynist who thinks a woman like RC will only get in the way, but in fact she's extremely skilled, often spotting details he's overlooked and saving his neck multiple times. Ratchet's group takes Optimus back to Autobot headquarters, which in the intervening years has expanded to encompass the entire volcano having become a huge complex where Autobots and humans live and work together. Here we meet the Autobot Springer, described as a muscular Arnold Schwarzenegger type, human computer programmer Ellen Prentice, and her son, Daniel. Daniel looks up to Rusty, but Ellen's not a fan, she preferred Daniel focus on his studies. Meanwhile, Tanker consoles Hot Rod, who's consumed with guilt over the role he played in Optimus's injuries. Guilt that only deepens when, after examination, Ratchet announces that Prime's wounds are fatal. Before he dies, Optimus passes his life essence, called his Matrix, represented by a small glowing figure of Prime himself made of pure light, to Magnus, who becomes the Autobot's new leader, Ultra Magnus. Concurrently, the Decepticons return to Cybertron to enshrine the dying Megatron's life essence in an urn in their Hall of Heroes, but begin fighting about who's going to take his place as the new leader. In the course of the fight, a stray blast from Skywarp accidentally destroys the urn intended to hold Megatron's essence. Unnoticed by his brawling troops, Megatron expires, and with nothing to contain it, his spirit drifts off into space, where it will evaporate into nothingness. Before that can happen, however, Megatron's essence is seized by a ray of cold light and pulled across space to the planet Unicron, a strange slab-shaped world covered in crystalline scales and undulating trees and grass. There, Megatron converses with the voice of an unseen being that refers to itself only as the Entity, the caretaker of Planet Unicron. The Entity offers Megatron a deal, enter his service and acquire him energy to feed the Planet Unicron, and in return he will be reborn in a powerful new body. Megatron accepts and is recreated through the Entity's power as Galvatron, his body wreathed in the same scales that cover Unicron. Galvatron returns to Cybertron, where the Decepticons are still fighting over leadership, and retakes command. The Entity's light shines down on Cybertron, transforming and powering up all the other Decepticons into new scale-covered forms, beginning with Starscream and the Jets. The Entity orders the Decepticons to travel to Earth and acquire the energy of the planet for him, but as they depart, the Entity's light expands to cover all of Cybertron, and the Transformers' homeworld is destroyed, collapsing in on itself and being sucked away across space through the beam of light for Unicron to feed upon. The Entity laughs off Galvatron's rage and horror, and under his breath, Galvatron vows revenge.
Back on Earth, in preparation for pursuing the Decepticons, the Autobots have begun construction of massive armoured shields, which they intend to ship out to Earth's major cities to serve as defence in case of an attack while they're off-planet. But when Galvatron and the Decepticons arrive, their new entity-given power allows them to cut through the shields like butter, and destroy all the spacecraft Wheeljack has been building. Badly outmatched, the Autobots are forced to abandon their headquarters and scatter to the four winds. After a short time skip, the Decepticons are shown to have taken over on Earth, where hunting parties of eerie, black-clad, Gestapo-like Decepticons now carry out sweeps in search of Autobot fugitives. Rusty narrowly avoids being spotted by one of these sweep parties, and rejoins a group of Autobots hiding out in the mountains where the news goes from bad to worse, as Wheeljack and RC report that the Decepticons have constructed a cage around Earth that is draining the planet's energy and beaming it off into space to Unicron, leaving Earth with only days to live. The camp is then discovered by the hunting party, so the Autobots keep the cons busy while the humans escape on a raft via a nearby river. Hound uses his holograms to confuse the cons with false targets, and Sideswipe and Sunstreaker clobber them with steel beams. With the humans safely away, the Autobots then escape under cover of a smokescreen created by an Autobot named Chemico. Hot Rod and Tanker are given the task of finding other scattered Autobots to form a crew who will head into space and find and destroy the source of the Decepticons' strange new power. A little later, Hot Rod and Tanker locate Springer in the desert, and watch as he uses the leaping power for which he's named to take out an entire Decepticon unit led by Starscream, Solo. Springer leads the pair to a nearby Autobot refinery to recruit more troops. They're attacked by Insecticons and more Decepticons on the way, but when they reach the refinery, help awaits in the form of the Dinobots, Grimlock, Sludge, and Swoop. Blur, a high-speed advanced scout, described as a slow-talking Jimmy Stewart sort, and the refinery's resident brainiac, Mentlar, a large-headed Autobot scientist who turns into a radar truck. Mentlar has invented an immunodestabilizer field that cuts the Decepticons off from the entity's power, reverting them back to their normal forms and allowing the Dinobots to send them packing. Unfortunately, the Decepticons are already developing a resistance to the destabilizer field, so Mentlar and his crew agree to join the mission into space. The Autobots all regroup in an Arctic ice cave, where Wheeljack and RC have been able to salvage a single spacecraft for the mission. Rusty will be going into space with the bots, and bids farewell to Daniel and Ellen. But then, the Decepticons attack, and in the chaos, Daniel and Ellen are forced to board the ship with Rusty, Magnus, Springer, Blur, and Mentlar as it blasts off. Hot Rod, Tanker, and the Dinobots fly alongside it, while Wheeljack, RC, General Blaze, and the other Autobots remain to continue the fight on Earth. The Decepticons try to close the energy cage around the Autobots to prevent their escape, but when the effort fails, the entity provides Galvatron with a spaceship so the Decepticons can pursue them. Mentlar and Ellen work together to calculate the location of the Decepticons' power source, tracking it to the Shadow Nebula, and Mentlar provides the humans with exosuits that enhance their strength. As they're getting to grips with them, the Decepticons catch up to the bots, and our heroes split up. Hot Rod's group takes refuge on a nearby, geologically unstable asteroid, while Magnus's team keeps the Decepticons busy, intending to blind them with flares, then slip away and join back up with Hot Rod's team on the asteroid. Unfortunately, Galvatron has sent Laserbeak to follow Hot Rod's team, so the Cons know where the Autobots are and simply follow them. The battle moves to the asteroid, during which a Decepticon bombing run flings Hot Rod's group off into space. Then, a galactic warp hurricane suddenly strikes, causing the Decepticon carrier to crash into the asteroid. Magnus can't pass up this fortuitous opportunity to escape and continue their mission, so his team are reluctantly forced to abandon Hot Rod's group and swiftly depart. When Galvatron emerges from the wreckage and detects no Autobot life signs, he believes all the bots have died in the storm, and the Decepticons return to finish matters on Earth. 
The last act of the film takes place across three different settings, each following a different group of characters, Hot Rod and Tanker's group, Magnus's team, and the Autobots on Earth. Hot Rod and Tanker's group crash land on an alien planetoid. Hot Rod and Tanker land in the ocean, where Tanker is dismembered by a robotic squid and saved by Hot Rod. Hot Rod puts the old bot back together, and they set out to search for the Dinobots. Instead, they encounter the alien Sharkticons, and when attempts to placate them with the universal greeting fail, they're taken prisoner. The creatures have also captured Sludge and Swoop, immobilizing them with stun sticks, and have begun taking bites out of Swoop. Tanker and Hot Rod are brought before the Sharkticons' masters, the Quintessons, creatures with spindly bodies, huge five-faced heads, and mental powers. There, they meet a fellow captive, the rock robot, Granix, last survivor of an expedition from Lithone, the planet of marble. Found guilty of trespassing on the Quintesson's world, Granix is thrown into a gladiatorial arena with the Sharkticons, who devour him. Watching the grisly scene, Hot Rod and Tanker realize that the primitive Sharkticons can only differentiate between enemies and other Sharkticons thanks to some simple sensors. So, when the two Autobots are tried and thrown into the arena a short time later, they concoct a plan, using grease and oil from their own bodies to blind the Sharkticon sensors and throw them into confusion. However, the Quintessons use their mental powers to telekinetically create new Sharkticons out of scrap metal that lack this weakness. But just as all seems lost, the Dinobots arrive. Grimlock has freed Sludge and Swoop, and they soon subdue the Sharkticons. Hot Rod forces the lead Quintesson to probe space with its mental powers for the location of Magnus's crew, and the team departs to join them. Magnus's group, meanwhile, arrive in the Shadow Nebula, where the sheer power of the entity's brain waves knocks their shuttle out of the sky and sends them crashing down to planet Unicron's moon. The entity contacts Galvatron on Earth, instructing him to come to the moon and finish off the Autobots for good, but Galvatron decides to disobey the order and remain to continue the fight on Earth. Mentlar sets about studying the substance of Unicron's moon, removing one of the crystalline scales from its surface, and this disturbance lets the entity know that Galvatron has not carried out his orders. He contacts Galvatron on Earth once more, and mentally tortures him into leaving the planet at once. Wheeljack, RC, and the other Autobots watch him go, and, their spirits buoyed by the revelation that Ultra Magnus still lives, press forward in battle against the other Decepticons who remain, with Wheeljack now finally starting to really appreciate RC's abilities, and with the hint of romance now blooming between them. Detecting the Decepticons' approach, the Autobots on Unicron's moon set up decoys, basically cardboard cutouts of themselves, to lure Galvatron and his men into a range of explosive charges they've planted. Magnus instructs Springer and the humans to make a break for safety while he, Blur, and Mantlar battle the Decepticons, but Rusty, seeing the Autobot leader's plan as suicide, attempts to stay and help him fight. As he does so, Rumble tries to force Daniel to watch as Dirge kills Ellen, but Daniel masters his exosuit and saves his mum from the cons, proving his independence to her. However, a second wave of Decepticons soon descends, forcing Springer and the humans to follow Magnus's plan. Magnus, Mantlar, and Blur hold the line to cover their escape, and are killed. Sensing the presence of Optimus Prime's life force, Galvatron cuts Magnus open and removes Prime's matrix to take as a prize, placing it in a bottle-like pendant around his neck. His mission accomplished, he departs to renegotiate terms with the entity. Meanwhile, Springer and the human's escape route leads them through a strange fog bank to a dried-out riverbed-like area where they're confronted by the Junkions, an eccentric tribe of road warrior-style robots led by the Nazi helmet-wearing Rekgar. Springer guides the humans in transforming their exosuits to flee from the strange newcomers, but the Junkions are able to capture them. Luckily, Hot Rod's group arrives and makes peace with the Junkions, presumably using the universal greeting, but the script is missing a page here, so we can't say for sure. 
Grimlock befriends a large junkion named Scrappo, and Rekgar provides the group with a printout of data which Ellen decodes. It reveals that the entity was, in fact, created by the Junkion's ancestors to serve as a universal protector, but something went wrong and it became evil. The Junkions had to live behind the Veil of Fog to be free of it. Fortunately, the printout also reveals the entity's weak spot. But the script's missing another page, so we don't know exactly what it is. Galvatron attempts to break his contract with the entity by threatening to destroy the planet Unicron with a thermal charge. But unsurprisingly, the charge has no effect. The Autobot forces then arrive and touch down on Unicron's surface just in time for the truth to be revealed. The entity and the planet Unicron are one and the same being. Thanks to the energy provided by the Decepticons, the entity now has the power to transform to robot mode and break the orbit it has been trapped in for generations. The tree trunks and grass on the planet's surface are but hairs on the back of its colossal hands. The robot mode entity heads for Earth to finish devouring it. While the Dinobots and Scrappo distract him, the other Autobots venture inside his body, where Springer and Tanker battle his immune system of metallic leeches, while Hot Rod and the humans head for the weak spot at his core. Unfortunately, they discover that the opening to the core is too small for any explosive to fit through. But Hot Rod senses the presence of the weapon they need, and the group returns to the surface to recover Optimus Prime's Matrix from Galvatron. Galvatron refuses to hand it over and tries to destroy both himself and the Matrix, preferring nothingness to a world in which he cannot rule. But Ellen finally gets the hang of her exosuit and surprises everyone by kung fuing the Decepticon leader into submission. Matrix in hand, the team returns to the core once more, where Daniel, the only one small enough to fit through the opening, climbs in and opens the Matrix. Optimus's life force destroys the entity from within, while Hot Rod leads the Autobots in evacuating the entity's exploding body. Galvatron is sent hurtling off into space on a piece of debris, while our heroes all triumphantly return to the healed, restored Earth for a victory ceremony at the new Autobot headquarters. After Friedman handed in the first draft, creative director Jay Bacall called up Flint Dilly to get his input on it. As Dilly tells it, he and Bacall concluded that the script was, basically, incoherent, and took it upon themselves to create their own script called The Secret of Cybertron. Written in a single week, this script combines select ideas from Friedman's script with an earlier idea Dilly had for an episode called Journey to the Center of Cybertron, and involved Optimus Prime traveling to the heart of the Transformers world and using his Matrix to transform the planet into a robot mode to battle the entity. Dilly has always said that very few people ever read this script, but the existence of a piece of concept art by Floro Deary of a robot mode Cybertron seems to suggest otherwise. To quote Dilly, he and Bacall were convinced that The Secret of Cybertron was the greatest script ever written by anybody for any reason. But executive producers Joe Bacall and Tom Griffin didn't share their enthusiasm for it, and it was rejected. Sadly, this script has never been found, thus its precise contents are unknown. But Dilly has always said that he reused several ideas from the story for the season 3 premiere, Five Faces of Darkness, including the idea of the Quintessons being the creators of the Transformers. The basic concept of Journey to the Center of Cybertron, meanwhile, would eventually become the second season two-parter, the key to Vector Sigma. With the secret of Cybertron off the table, it fell to Dilly and Bacall to start fresh, taking the bones of Friedman's first draft and restructuring it into a new outline. Tightening up the story, 
finalizing characters' names, roles, and personalities, and incorporating requests from Hasbro to feature more toys from the 1986 product line. The new outline was completed in March, and from there Friedman wrote an entirely new script, which was delivered in April, then had a few pages revised in May. This version hit the same big story bullet points as the first, but now arranged into a form that was much closer to the movie we know today. The second draft is set five years in the future. In terms of characters, it places much greater emphasis on Hot Rod maturing to become the true new Autobot leader at the end of the film than the first draft did, as he's transformed by Optimus Prime's Matrix into Rodimus Prime. In turn, Ultra Magnus is played as a more fallible figure than the bold hero of the first draft, depicted more as just a soldier struggling and failing to fill Optimus' shoes. Wheeljack and his bickering relationship with RC are dropped, and RC is moved over to become part of Magnus' shuttle crew rather than staying on Earth. Tanker is reworked to become the pickup truck Cup, but the character remains basically the same personality-wise while Blur's personality is overhauled to introduce his fast-talking gimmick. Rusty, Ellen and Blaze are taken out, but Daniel remains the only human featured in the film. Rusty's Indiana Jones-style personality is given over to Springer. The entity is renamed, with Friedman thinking up several alternatives, including Absorber, Amalgamator and Masticar, before settling on Ingestor and Optimus Prime's Matrix and Megatron's Essence are both renamed Life Sparks. The additional new toys that Hasbro requested be added to the second draft could be split into two groups. Figures from the 1985 product line who would continue to be sold in 1986, with whom audiences would already be familiar thanks to the first and second seasons of the cartoon, and brand new toys currently in development for the 86 line. 1985 characters added, or given bigger roles, included the Dinobots, who the second draft introduces earlier, replacing Rails as the big Autobot reinforcements in the opening battle. The Constructicons, who now combine into Devastator for a big showcase fight scene with the Dinos, Perceptor, who replaces Mantlar as the scientist on Ultra Magnus's crew, Blaster, who joins the cast in a supporting role, and the Triple Changers Blitzwing and Astro Train, who were given prominent moments amidst the action. Brand new 1986 characters added include Wheelie, an Autobot child encountered by Hot Rod's group on Quintessa, who effectively takes the role of Scrappo as a friend to the Dinobots and Galvatron's new minions, Scourge and Cyclonus. To incorporate these two new Decepticons into the story, the second draft's version of the Decepticon fight in the Hall of Heroes includes them shattering several of the other urns enshrined there, releasing the life sparks of other dead Decepticons that drift off into space along with Megatrons. It's these additional life sparks that Ingestor then uses to create Scourge and Cyclonus. Scourge was specifically conceived to be the leader of the Gestapo Decepticons featured in the first draft. Friedman described those Decepticons as a sweep party, meaning a party that conducts sweeps. But somewhere along the way, the name got reinterpreted a bit literally, and Sweeps actually became the name of these evil huntsmen, who were reimagined as identical copies of Scourge, also created from life sparks by Ingestor. Cyclonus too was meant to have his own armada of nameless duplicates at this point, but this idea was almost entirely phased out for the finished film. In it, only a single Cyclonus duplicate appears, before vanishing a few seconds later and never being seen again. Brief digression here, the Life Spark concept led to an interesting little mistake in issue number 80 of the British Transformers comic. While working on the movie tie-in story Target 2006, writer Simon Furman was using as reference a version of the script that contained at least some lingering reference to the Life Spark idea. 
he wound up misinterpreting a stage direction that said Cyclonus is created from life spark, and the result was a confusing scene where Cyclonus claimed he was rebuilt from a Decepticon named Life Spark. Another toy plan for 1986 was the Autobot Citybot Metroplex. This inspired the addition of an Autobot City to the second draft of the film, which replaced the steel mill and Autobot headquarters in the first act action. But clearly, nobody had been provided with much information about the toy, as the film's depiction of the city doesn't really match the figure. Most notably, of course, it never transforms into a robot mode, only moving between city and battle station forms. Before ever seeing the toy, Floro Deary created his own entirely original designs for the city, including the one you're seeing on screen right now, which transforms from city to fortress by rising up out of the ground and closing around itself like a fist. Deary notes that he also created a second design, styled after New York, and when he was instructed to redesign the city to better match the Metroplex toy, rather than start from scratch, he admits to simply pasting a few toy-based details onto this design, creating the finished look seen in the film. Another group of new toys in production for 86 were five wild animal-themed robots who could combine into a giant super robot. These were the figures that would eventually be released as the Predacons. But at this early stage in development, they were envisioned as an Autobot team named the Anibots, who were added to the second draft, battling Devastator alongside the Dinobots. But Friedman was provided with no information about the figures beyond their alternate modes and the fact they combined, and so let his imagination run wild, writing the team as merging into the four-legged, lightning-breathing Dragon Beast. Now obviously this had nothing to do with what Hasbro was developing for the toys, and had to be cut from the film. But it got far enough before that happened that art for Dragon Beast was produced by Deary. It's with instances like this in mind that I think reels in the first draft could have been the result of Friedman being directed to include the toy that would become Astro Train, but only being told that it was a triple changing train and again letting his imagination go crazy. That's just my personal theory, but I think it's plausible. Other new products incorporated into the Autobot City Battle included Blasters cassettes, which at this point were going to be a robot, a lion, a tiger, and a scorpion, all real prototyped and patented toy designs, which were also set to be included in the Season 2 episode Autobop later in 1985. Friedman named the robot Bolts, the lion Cubby, the tiger Stripes, and the scorpion Stinger. But somewhere along the way, plans changed. The toy line replaced the tiger and the scorpion with a second robot and a rhino, and they were all given new names. The robots eject and rewind, the lion Steeljaw, and the rhino Ramhorn. Amid the changes, they were dropped from Autobop, and the film was adjusted accordingly. But while new toys meant the addition of new characters, the opposite was also true. The only confirmed casualties in the first draft were Optimus Prime, Ultra Magnus, Blur, and Mentlar. But after he was given a list of toys that were being discontinued, meaning that it was okay to kill the characters, the second draft sees Friedman begin adding the scenes of death that the film would become infamous for. In less toy-motivated changes, the second draft introduces the idea of the Autobots having a base on one of Cybertron's moons, and the Decepticons hijacking a departing shuttle and killing its crew to launch their siege on Autobot City. Also, it drops the idea of all the Decepticons being powered up by Ingestor. In Starscream's specific case, rather than gain increased power, he's killed by Galvatron when he takes back command. Significantly, Cybertron is not destroyed. Rather, the Decepticons simply send in Jestor all the energy they have stockpiled on the planet, which gives him the strength to break his orbit and begin heading towards Cybertron itself, earning Galvatron's ire by eating two of its moons along the way, including the one on which the Autobots are based. 
The whole idea of the Autobots scattering across Earth and Hot Rod and Cup having to gather a crew is dropped, with the Autobots now simply taking off aboard two shuttles to escape the Decepticon attack, and the long, rambling space battle that followed is massively cut down, ditching all mention of the asteroid and the hurricane, and instead involving Hot Rod's team being shot down and Magnus's team escaping the Decepticons by faking their shuttle's destruction. However, the idea of a third plotline centred on Earth remains, with Scourge and the Sweeps staying behind on the planet to drain its energy and send it to Ingestor, and an Autobot guerrilla team led by Blaster combating their efforts. But still, it's Cybertron, rather than the Earth, that now serves as Ingestor's final target and the setting of the film's climax. The second draft's version of the adventure on Quintessa removes the Quintesson's mental powers and Hot Rod's plan to blind the Sharkticon sensors, and the Dinobots are never captured. Instead, the Dinos search for Hot Rod and Cup, but when they arrive at the Quintesson fortress, they're deliberately pointed in the wrong direction by the guard at the entrance. This is where Wheelie comes in, leading the Dinobots to where they need to go, then pointing the Autobots to the ship they need to escape the planet. Notably, the Quintessons are still described as having bodies at this point, but their depiction does move closer to what we see in the finished film, as it's revealed that their large heads are their true form. Their bodies are only prosthetic, and their heads can disconnect from them and fly around. In a big change from the first draft, the Junkions have no connection to Ingestor, who now has no explained origin. Instead of Unicron's moon, the Junkions live on the planet Junkion, where Magnus's team sets down to make repairs. The battle on the planet of Junk does still involve the Autobots tricking the Decepticons with decoy models of themselves, but it's changed significantly. Rather than using 2D cutouts to lure the cons into a trap, the Autobots use moving, three-dimensional models of themselves constructed by Perceptor to fool the Decepticons into thinking they've all been destroyed while they escape to safety. In reality, only Ultra Magnus dies, sacrificing himself to make the ruse convincing and ensure his comrades get safely away. But unlike the first draft, he doesn't stay dead, being rebuilt by the Junkions after Hot Rod befriends them. As in the first draft, Galvatron still attempts to destroy the planet Unicron with a thermal charge, which Unicron simply absorbs. Here, it's what provides the final bit of energy Ingestor needs to transform to robot mode. The climax plays out much like the finished movie, with Hot Rod confronting Galvatron inside Ingestor and being transformed into Rodimus Prime by the power of Optimus's life spark which he then releases to destroy Ingestor from within. One notable difference, though, is that while escaping, Rodimus finds the two moons Ingestor earlier consumed intact within his body, and releases them to resume their orbit around Cybertron. After handing in the second draft, Friedman's involvement with the film ended. It was now the job of Dilly to massage the script into its finished form, for which he received the credit of Story Consultant. This process reportedly involved many rewrites, with contributions from many different writers, to the point that Dilly calls the finished movie a Frankenstein of different ideas and drafts and people. We don't know precisely how many discrete drafts Dilly went through during this lengthy process, but we do have access to one more full version of the script, dated August 1985. This is the version of the script that's been available online since the 90s. It's very close to the finished film, outside of a couple of deleted and alternate scenes, and it illustrates the various changes made to the story in the course of the many summer rewrites. By this point, the decision had been made to advance the setting of the film to 20 years in the future, rather than just five, to the year 2005, which allowed an adult version of Spike with Wiki to be added to the cast, stationed on a second Autobot moon base, and for Daniel to be reimagined as his son. Other new ideas introduced by the time of this draft included the Autobots escaping Earth by using a tactic they once employed in a past battle off the planet Beta 4, 
which involves causing asteroids to collide with each other to create a debris field that blocks the pursuing Decepticons long enough for them to get away, Hot Rod's crew being dragged down to Quintessa by a huge mechanical claw that reaches up to grab them instead of simply shot down, the Quintessons being the servants of Unicron who hunt down those who escape his wrath, and Ultra Magnus being drawn and quartered by the sweeps at the climax of the battle on Junkion instead of being blown to bits. Now as it happens, all these new ideas wound up being taken back out of the film, but it's apparent that the August Draft, or one very much like it, was used as reference in the creation of Marvel's comic book adaptation of the film, released in summer 1986, as the comic includes all this deleted and alternate material. But perhaps the single biggest change the rewrites leading up to this draft introduced, which survived all the way through to the finished movie and required many structural changes to the story, was the decision to abandon the concept of life sparks. Firstly, this change sees Megatron have to be dumped into space on the journey back to Cybertron while still alive, rather than having him die and his spark float off. Likewise, the other Decepticons transformed by Unicron are changed to be established characters jettisoned alongside Megatron, rather than spirits of the nameless dead released from the Hall of Heroes. The influence of the concept can still be seen in the finished film though. The flickering purple flames seen at the base of the statues in the Hall of Heroes were originally designed to be the interred life sparks of past Decepticon leaders. The bigger consequence of ditching life sparks is that Optimus Prime's spark is replaced in the story with a physical talisman of leadership which returns to using Friedman's original name for the concept, the Matrix. Compared to the earlier drafts, in which the ability of Prime Spark to destroy Ingestor is pretty random and not really foreshadowed, the Matrix is presented as the prophesied tool of his defeat, and thus becomes the object around which the whole film revolves. Knowing it can destroy him, the destruction of the Matrix is what Unicron now demands Galvatron do for him, instead of providing him with energy. And obtaining the Matrix is what gives Galvatron the confidence to challenge Unicron, as compared to just being armed with an ineffective thermal charge. And this all goes hand in hand with the other big change. The whole third act twist that Ingestor and Unicron are the same being is dropped in favour of depicting Unicron as a living, sentient planet from the outset, already roaming the galaxy consuming other worlds, rather than being trapped in an orbit. Thus in this version of the story he doesn't need the Decepticons to provide him with energy, which in turn means that there's no longer a point to the whole subplot on Earth, and it's cut entirely. Accompanying this change to Unicron's depiction, the role of Granix, the ill-fated robot made of rock encountered by Hot Rod and Cup on Quintessa, is notably expanded, with the addition of a prologue to the movie that shows Granix escaping the destruction of his world, Lithone, at Unicron's hands. This becomes the reason for his capture and execution by the Quintessons, in accordance with their role in this draft as Unicron's servants. During the development of this prologue, the idea that Granix and his race were rock robots was abandoned, and they were reimagined as wholly mechanical life forms, a decision that it seems reasonable to assume might have been influenced by the news that rival toy company Tonka were producing their own toy line and film about transforming rock robots that same year, the Rock Lords. Accordingly, by the time of the August draft, Granix, originally named after Granite, a type of stone, was renamed Cranix. Key differences between this draft's iteration of the prologue and the finished version are that Unicron consumes Lithone by dissolving it with an acidic mist, and the Lithones are depicted as transformers, able to convert into spaceships, which is how Cranix escapes the death of his world. The finished film changes this so that Cranix simply boards an ordinary ship, but like other material from the August draft, the early version remains in the comic book adaptation.
That effectively brings this look at the development of the script of Transformers the movie to an end where the film itself begins. There would be multiple small rewrites even after this point, with two more slightly different versions of the script being used as a basis for the film's primary dialogue recording sessions in September, and for the finalised storyboards that were drawn up between October and December. But the differences were positively minor in comparison to how far the story had come since the previous year. Both the recordings and the storyboards still contain a fair bit of material from the August draft that would later be deleted, but some standout examples of scenes unique to these versions include brief speaking appearances by Inferno and Gears, for which actors Walker Edmiston and Don Messick remain credited, a death scene for Mirage, blown to bits by Megatron, and perhaps most famously, Red Alert being gunned down by the Constructicons as he, Trax and Sideswipe engage them when they tear into the city. All these and more were progressively trimmed out during animation and editing over the months that followed, until finally the movie as we know it today was released in August 1986. If you'd like to learn even more about the differences between the various versions of the movie's script, check the description below and you'll find links to the various drafts, outlines, storyboards and more, all hosted at the Sunbow Marvel Archive alongside mountains of other paperwork from Transformers and other shows. There are tons more little details in there, so many I simply can't cover them all. Read them for yourselves and you'll agree. The story of Transformers the movie is beyond good, beyond evil, beyond your wildest imagination.